let's take a look at the community power debate. Debates about the nature of power became particularly focused in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s in the field of political science. During this time, scholars attempted to examine systematically the issue of who holds and exercises power in society. The debate between two camps became known as the community power debate. The pluralists argued that power was equitably distributed throughout society and that no particular group had undue influence over decision making. The elitists, on the other hand, claimed that power was concentrated in the hands of a privileged few who controlled political agents. The pluralists adopted what can be called as a one-dimensional view of power, while the elitists developed a two-dimensional view. Power is exercised when people's behaviors are affected in some way, like people are persuaded to do something or persuaded not to do something. This three-dimensional view of power argues that conflict is not necessarily a condition for the exercise of power. Ideology and power are closely connected. Ideology, as the term suggests, operates in the realm of ideas and meanings. In this sense, a simple way to understand the concept of ideology is to see it as providing the link between meaning and power. That is, ideology functions as an interpretive lens through which people come to understand what exists, what is good, and what is possible. Ideology then works to manage the relationship between communication and power by shaping the ways social reality is constructed. However, ideology does not work that simply. Indeed, because it's largely about meaning and systems of signification, dominant ideologies are frequently challenged and vulnerable to change. Organizational control is at the, its most effective when employees fail to differentiate between their own identities and the identity presented by their company. A fascinating contradiction emerges in which teams were introduced, at least in part, to provide workers with more autonomy and decision-making freedom, but end up being more oppressive and stressful than traditional work arrangements. The identification process becomes less about identifying with the organization and more about identifying with one's team. Employees often resist organizational control efforts engaging in individual and collective acts of resistance. Many activities cannot be classified as outright resistance to organizational power, but frequently involve either undercover forms of resistance or subtle efforts to co-opt dominant meanings to serve alternative purposes. Of course, resistance at work is not a new phenomenon and has been a feature of organizational life throughout the industrial age. Forms of resistance point to various ways in which the process of corporate colonization can be undermined. Resistance is important as it suggests the ways organizations exist as sites of struggle where alternatives are a process that can develop. The configurations of power have changed with the emergence of neoliberalism and the post-Fordist organization. Ideas like the enterprise self, the social factory, and immaterial labor mean that the relationship between organizations and employees has shifted. From a power perspective, one way to frame this shift is in terms of a change from managerial efforts to discipline people to get them to behave in specific ways. The goal of power is not to make people docile and obedient, but rather to encourage them to engage in competitive social relations and to view themselves as human capital in every sphere of life. Adopting the term biocracy to identify the exercise of by power and work contexts, the post-Fortis workplace control is different from earlier forms of control, such as Taylorism, bureaucracy, and even culture and management. Biocracy promotes freedom and expression of lifestyle attitudes at work. This new form of power reflects the neoliberal conception of human beings, not just as participants in an economic exchange relationship, but as the living embodiment of capital. Under this view, power is increasingly dispersed and diffuse, saturating most aspects of life through the creation of a social factory where all forms of interaction are monetizable. Such a view suggests that we try to rethink the relation between work and life. 